so we'll be talking today. Um, so I would say throughout the course, we've been really uh, looking specifically um, at different aspects of industrialized construction, about the customer, about the production system, about the supply chain and logistics. Um, and today I want to take a kind of step back. Uh, in fact, it's going to be one of two uh, uh, classes in a row where we take a step back and we look at what's happening to construction and how is the overall industry changing. Um, and part of that is a conversation around business models. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that we talk about quite often is that technology alone does not necessarily change an industry or it kind of creates incremental improvements. But when you couple technology with a new business model, then you actually see, in some cases, widespread industry disruption. Um, so this was a bit of uh, research that I did myself and some thinking around um, how industrialized construction is actually bringing different and new um, changes in the structure and the, and the business models of industrialized construction. And it will have implications for your uh, projects because you'll also have to think about your business model approach. And we'll talk more about that in the lab session. And then today during the guest lecture, we will have a guest lecture from Mobit, which is a um, a very interesting industrialized construction startup doing 3D printing in the French speaking part of Switzerland. And uh, looking forward to, to having them speak with us today as well. So let's get into it. Um, I'll start with first a story. Uh, you know, this is the mesh mold uh, 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 double curvature wall. Alex actually was highly heavily involved with working on this project. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, industry that have come and visited things like the DFAB house and the robotic fabrication lab um, for the NCCR digital fabrication. And I'm, I'm pretty well connected with some industry people. Uh, and so they might come and visit and before COVID, I would give them a tour. And um, I would always hear that this is, oh wow, this is really amazing. This is such interesting stuff. And, um, and then I would always ask the question, um, okay, well, what would it take for you to implement this in your company? And the response I would almost always get back was, wow, this is way too far away. We could never do something like this in our company. And that's really, it was very interesting to me because these are construction companies and often world leading construction companies, um, yet they couldn't quite see the right ways to fit things like digital fabrication, robotics. And I would even go so far as kind of traditional prefab processes into the structure of their existing construction company. Um, and so I was trying to figure out some ways to, to understand and explain why it was so hard for industrialized construction robotics to find its way into, um, into the industry. And I've came across this quote, uh, I'll read it to you first and then give you some context. Um, it talks about the current business strategy overall in construction. The quote says, in the construction industry, many firms have shielded themselves from technological competition. They've enjoyed a false sense of security. The industry suffers from declining productivity, falling profitability, and worsening competitive positioning, which if you've kind of followed along in, in our course and, and in my lean course, we talk about these problems that face construction. And I think when they talk about the dominant business strategy of construction, this is what really struck me. Cost minimization rather than new product development is the dominant business strategy. In other words, the main focus of most construction companies, and I would argue also architecture design firms or engineering firms, um, is a, a cost minimization strategy where you try to reduce the cost to the clients and therefore save money. So you become more efficient. But that's only one way to have value in a business. The other way is to, is to have new product development. So um, one argument that I like to make is that we've tried for a long time to squeeze every possible cost minimization out of the process, but we don't engage with new product development, which might enable us to, to do better. Um, now, interestingly enough, this is not a new phenomenon. This quote was 30 years old. So, um, and I think it's still relevant today is that we really focus in kind of traditional architecture, engineering, construction industry on cost minimization. And cost minimization is good, but I think we also need to look at new product development. And that's really what a big focus on this class is about. You're thinking about new products. Um, I go back to my own dissertation a little bit where I first came across this problem of new product development. Um, this is a company called Connects Tech. I think some of you may have looked at it. 
um, it's, a, it's a space frame moment connection. Um, so if you see here, you have the worker who's kind of dropping it into place, and then there's a bolted connection. So um, in, in the United States, uh, steel construction is quite uh, popular. I'd say more popular than here, although it does exist here as well in Switzerland. Um, it's also a very dangerous job. You have these uh, workers up here uh, uh, welding in space. You have big pieces of metal moving around. Um, it's one of the most dangerous jobs in construction. And this product offered a very competitive solution. It's very fast, extremely fast, because you just drop it in and then you provide a bolted connection. Um, but it slots directly into place, where it, whereas uh, in contrast, you have to kind of hold it exactly in place, align it, and then and then do your welds, which takes quite a bit of time. Um, so this product was, uh, and it was also more sustainable. So it was in many ways a superior product. It was uh, it was faster. Um, it was uh, greener, less less. Um, uh, you know, less waste. It was more safe. The only problem it had was it was slightly more expensive. They would, ConnectX would say they're probably about cost, cost neutral if you account for all things, but in a competitive kind of low tender process, they would often lose um, or they would not be selected, um, which was really unfortunate. Um, then I had a chance uh, during my, my PhD studies, I visited their factory and it was really great to see how they were doing it. And this was a chart that I came across. I took a picture on the left and here's actual, I got the the high resolution image later. Um, I found it really interesting. They had this chart in here um, where they were talking about what they called the collaborative void. So this was back in 2013. This was an industrialized construction startup. And they said, basically, we're down here and these are all the people we have to convince all the way up here to implement our product, right? So they would have to convince the specialty contractor, the general contractor, construction manager, codes, regulatory, consultants, engineers, architects, and the owner. And this was what they found, they called it like the beehive or the swarm or, or like a, just all the things that they had to, they had to get across to just implement their products, which offered better value. I would argue much better value, just not immediate cost savings. Um, and this is the, the kind of overall problem we have in the construction industry. I describe it like this is that we have a very fragmented industry structure in construction. I know for those of you that have not worked before, um, you maybe have not seen this but, and, or, or, or felt it, but for those who have worked for a little while, um, we often talk about industry fragmentation as a barrier to innovation. Um, and specifically, we could think about how the industry is structured with three degrees of fragmentation. So we have fragmentation that exists in the vertical dimension. This means you have a certain set of companies that design the project, right? So the architects and the engineers. Then you have another set of companies that are going to construct the project. So the construction managers, the general contractors, and the suppliers. Um, and uh, then you have a third set of people that will operate the project uh, when it's done. So these are the building owners and the maintenance and equipment managers um, who kind of run the life cycle. And one thing that we have in this vertical fragmentation is, is there's incentives to kind of just do the best for yourself because once the project's out of your hands, it doesn't really matter for you anymore if it's the most efficient for, let's say, the operations. So um, in that sense, you try to optimize your own stage, but not necessarily like the life cycle costs. And I think you have classes for those of you that have taken classes about life cycle analysis. Um, you see that you know, oftentimes decisions are not made that are best for operations or construction, but they're made because they're best for the design cycle, right? So we have this vertical fragmentation. Um, then we have a second degree of fragmentation. That's the horizontal fragmentation. So there you have broken the product. And I'm going to use the term product architecture. It doesn't mean architecture like we think of today, but it's the idea of the product structure or how we break up the part into, um, uh, into understandable pieces. So we have then horizontal fragmentation, sorry, skipped ahead, uh, between like the mechanical and the electrical plumbing, the steel or structural uh, systems. And so each of these are their own little silos where um, you, know, you have a, a, a structural engineer who will design the structure, but they're not thinking about the mechanical systems, right? Um, and then this is further compounded because we have a low tender bid process, right? So everything within a silo has to compete within that silo. And it's very difficult to cross subsidize new product developments like Connects Tech, which actually would save a project money because it would be a shorter project. It would allow all the other trades to go more faster and more efficiently. 
but um, that's very hard to kind of figure out in this low tender process. So you just end up going with the lowest cost in each uh, silo in your low bid tender process. Um, so therefore we don't optimize the overall system, but we optimize the, the parts, the little pieces. And finally, we have something called the uh, innovation, uh, or we have the longitudinal fragmentation. And we've talked a lot about this in class. So I think you kind of understand this, but here's the illustration is that um, in traditional industry, we come together on a project by project basis, but we kind of remake this supply chain every project. We never have continuity between projects. So even if at the end of project one, we learn all the ways that we could cross subsidize, develop new products and do better next time, we never really work together with the same partners again. So therefore, we, we, we just kind of continue to, to have this problem. This was turned a, a learning disability um, that slows down our, our innovation diffusion because we can't learn because we only exist in these projects. That's just a little bit of theory about this industry fragmentation. Um, and then I, I jumped to um, trying to understand what's going on here. Why was it so hard? Um, why is it so hard for us to uh, understand and get around this fragmentation. And I came across um, Conway's law from computer science, which I thought was really helpful. Um, and the law stated like this, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure, sorry, it's cut off a little bit, is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Um, now this has been known uh, later as a mirroring hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that, um, products will mirror organizations structures or and or organizations mirror product structures. We're not sure which way it goes. But essentially, um, the final product in that you make in our in our case of building um, is a, a copy or a representation of the communication that exists to build that that building, right? So if we communicate in silos, then the product will be built with silos and they'll be very difficult to integrate across those those kind of uh, silos of of information. And so, um, you know, a question that I often ask is, do our final products demonstrate a thriving communication and organizational structure, right? So um, it, it do, if we looked at our product representations, you know, does it show that we really can communicate and organize well, or do our product designs tend to have a few problems? Um, and so you can see a couple examples here, and I think these are kind of cheater ones that I just found online where I looked at like, you know, bad construction coordination or something like this. Um, but we do see in, in a larger sense, we have trouble with coordinating um, uh, uh, coordinating these complex tasks. Um, and so you don't, these are extreme examples, but you don't have to talk to very many people before you realize that this is also the reality of today. Um, so then we start thinking, then I start to, to, to think and, and, and try to understand um, what does this look like compared to other industries? I know we compare a lot to the automotive industry and we have a far weaker kind of systems integration in construction than we do in, in automotive. So um, in automotive, uh, in construction, what we have is a very decentralized organizational model. Um, you will tend to have a systems integrator in the middle, uh, the architect uh, during the design phase or the general contractor during the construction phase. But these, these coordinators will tend to be relatively weak. Um, an example is if you look at a construction project, which will be, you know, if it's a, if it's a million franc project or more, you'll have many, many trades on site working and you'll have a management team of five to six to 10 um, uh, people for the general contractor, but these people cannot closely monitor all the work. Um, really what the way that work gets done is that we have standards of craft administration we have codes, we have ways that kind of dictate the way work is done. Um, this is very different than if you look at Toyota where they're much stronger uh, or, or any car company where they're much stronger systems integrated where they're specifically designing how something should be built. In construction, we tend to leave that to the decentralization of the supply chain. Um, and so what you have is you have a lot of low bid firms in the supply chain who coordinate with each other um, and the contractor, the architect kind of loosely fits it all together, but they're not a very like a strong coordinator, we would say, we're not really, they're not forcing it to happen. And this works okay if you have a standard building, it's actually quite fine, there's nothing wrong with this approach. Um, if you're just trying to build things the way you've always built them before, there's really no problem with this organizational model. Um, but the challenge comes when we try to change the product architecture. This type of uh, organizational structure resists 
changes in the in the in the product architecture. And I think this quote kind of wraps it up is um, over time, organizations develop organizational structures and information channels that are focused on the component level activity. So we try to optimize the concrete or we try to optimize um, the electrical, but uh, what and this is fine from a single by trade perspective, but these these organizations tend to lose their ability to innovate at the global level or at the systems level, right? And a lot of what we try to do in this class uh, is break out of these silos and move away from just trying to design a structural engineering job or, or the architecture, but really think at a systems level, how do we optimize our new products? So what happens is that the industry then kind of becomes caught in what we call a mirroring trap. So um, the mirroring trap is, and I'm getting quite a little bit theoretical on the organizational side, but please stick with me. The idea is that our, our product design is, is decomposed into systems that match our fragmentation. And then if an innovation fits within that single silo, um, I use an example of a light bulb. If we go from kind of an incandescent light bulb to now an energy efficient light bulb, there's really no problem with that kind of innovation, right? You just take the old one out and you put the new one in, right? But if the innovation crosses over the boundaries between silos, we really don't have the, um, the capacity to manage or integrate these innovations into our construction projects today. Um, 3D printing, for example, really breaks down the barriers and the supply chain uh, um, boundaries. So then we need to think about what is the best strategy to bring such an innovation to the market? And you might need to think about that with your own proposed startup companies as well, is how do you, if you are breaking kind of the normal ways of doing things, do you need a new way to bring it to the market? And so um, that's where, and the paper you read was an updated version of this presentation. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of show the original one where we had four different ways that companies are breaking these barriers and creating systemic innovations. And I categorized that from fragmentation towards integration. I think it will help you kind of understand how I see the construction industry changing. Um, so, you know, for the purpose of, of, of specifically adopting systemic innovations. Um, so the first one that's happening today is we're seeing a lot of examples of like supply chain integration practices. And this is a bit of a promo for my lean integrated digital project delivery class. We talk about these in my class. So it's the use of BIM, it's the use of lean construction, which we have here, tack time planning. Um, it's the idea that we kind of integrate the information, the organization and processes among the many firms. And uh, what this does is it kind of brings everyone tighter together, right? So now um, we're not so decentralized, we're a little bit tighter, we work closer together, but the overall structure is roughly the same. We're just hopefully more efficient. Um, and then in that class as well, we talk a little bit about the idea of IPD, integrated project delivery, or this like project-based company where we have a, a, a kind of draw a boundary around a set of companies we pool all the money so it enables them to subsidize innovations and work together. And that's the idea of IPD. Again, if, if uh, you're interested in these, um, we, we cover them in my class in, in the autumn semester. Um, now, these three are all kind of the traditional way and then some of these IPD and lean and BIM, they still revolve around a project orientation. So they're really oriented towards project by project organizing. What we talk about in this class is really this platform orientation or this, excuse me, or this investment in con continuity of, of platforms. And within that, oh yeah, we've talked about this already. Sorry, uh, I didn't get a chance to go over this. Within that, we see that there's two different ways to, to do that. So um, the first one is the vertical integration approach that we've talked about. Um, and we're gonna talk much more about that uh, next week when we talk about Katera. And then the other way is this uh, industry 4.0 integration, um, which basically is a way of, of, uh, of integrating you know, the supply chain without owning everything in the supply chain, this orchestrator model. Um, so these are the two different approaches that, that we see emerging with the platform orientation that tries to integrate more longitudinally. And this, as I mentioned, this presentation was, was a year old because I just sent you that book chapter where I kind of updated this with a spin-off company as well. It's uh, somewhere in the middle. Um, but that's kind of theoretical and I, I wanna get away from just the theoretical approach. So I wanted to present three case studies of, um, of how we see this happening using some examples we've talked about in class. 
Um, so I'll give these three examples of how companies are using new business models to achieve industrialized construction. Um, so the first one is uh, an example of digital building components. This was a spin-off from an existing construction company. The second one is Katera, which I'll introduce. We've talked about it a little bit. We'll talk more next week, but I'll quickly introduce them this week. And third is one that I've mentioned before in the class, which is Project Frog. So I'm going to go through each of these companies and specifically try to show how they're using a new business model approach. And the thinking is that industrialized construction requires a systems level redesign. So it requires us to think from the systems level again and to redefine the, the kind of product structure. Um, so, so we're asking what are the emerging business models and, and the technical approaches that can break the mirror between our knowledge of, of, um, of tasks and, and products. Okay, um, yep, here are the three examples. Uh, so here's the first one. This was uh, DPR Construction is one of the largest uh, general contractors in the United States. Um, they also have just recently expanded to Europe and are doing projects in uh, Switzerland for data center companies. Um, and they decided to spin off a company called Digital Building Components. So essentially what happened was that DPR Construction was getting a sense of what was happening with industrialization. They were coordinating projects where they would start to use more and more prefabrication. Um, and they wanted to move into the area of industrialization, but they also recognized that they were not the best fit for them them they themselves to do it. They were still managing projects. So what they did is they seed funded a startup or a spinoff called Digital Building Components. And they own, um, they gave kind of half of the, the startup uh, they owned half the equity of digital building components, and then they raised the rest of the costs from other financial opportunities. Um, and here's an uh, example of digital building components. Uh, you know, here they're, they're going to do um, light gauge steel uh, uh, panel uh, solutions. Um, you know, so here's just a couple pictures from, from what they're doing with some automated machinery and also looking at the number of, uh, of sheeting screws. So in the traditional way, they said that this would take 125 hours and using digital fabrication, that they want to reduce it down to, to 18 hours. So they have three different products and I don't want to spend too much time on what they're doing, um, but then they, they worked on uh, load bearing and then exteriors and, and then interior panels here. So you can see some of their different, different approaches. Um, and they also really focused on a model driven process. So they were taking and leveraging their competencies with BIM to drive um, more effective uh, approaches to prefabrication. So this was their overall process design. They went from an architectural design model to uh, like a Revit model to a fabrication model, and then would go to their different stations in order to create their, um, their manufacturing. And the overall takeaway, I, I mean, this is less about all about um, digital building components, but more just about trying to understand what, what they're doing, is this spin-off construction to company approach um, was positive for them because it was little change to their established business. So they were able to exist still as DPR construction and spin off this other company um, <laughs> with, uh, with this other company with, um, uh, of digital building components. And it also was a very nice mutual relationship between the two because they had a structured learning process between the two sides. Um, the negative side was that they said it was a very, when I talked with them, they said it's a very slow implementation. Um, it takes quite a long time for them uh, to, to um, get each of their partners up in understanding what they're offering. And they said that they would have to re-educate the supply chain each time. Um, so, you know, for them, this was a, this a big advantage, but it was not a very fast approach. So it took them, took them a long time to, to do this. What was interesting is that then they said the digital building components was starting to also sell to some of DPR's competitors. So they were, they were um, establishing themselves as their own independent company, but their success would also mean the DPR would, would succeed because they had invested together. I've got some, some kids yelling around. Um, so let's see here. Sorry, I'm trying to find the right slides. Okay. So next is the example of Katera. And um, your reading for the next week is to do a case study 
uh, reading about Katera. There's two readings that you'll find. One is one that was written in 2018, where um, they are describing kind of the setup of Katera and helping you understand the vision behind it. And then we have a very recent article, which has talked about a lot of the problems and the challenges that Katera has faced. So um, please read them both and be prepared for our case discussion next week, where we're gonna really, it's not gonna be me lecturing, but it's gonna be uh, breakout rooms and kind of some questions about the advantages, disadvantages of Katera's approach. Um, but the biggest thing about Katera, what characterizes them is this vertical integration approach. So they are, they are um, highly vertically integrated. Um, here on the right, you can see all the different uh, um, uh, skills uh, that they put in-house. So they try to go all the way from architecture and engineering through factories, uh, manufacturing, um, uh, all the way through to property management. So they try to really vertically integrate the entire supply chain. And they wanted to do this by essentially streamlining the whole process. And they were very successful in raising funding. So this was in 2018. They raised another 865 million. I think their total fundraising is somewhere above 2 billion US dollars um, that they've raised, uh, a lot from SoftBank, which is a Japanese investment firm, a venture capital fund. Uh, so they tried to become the first, I would say, international industrialized construction company. So these were all of their different uh, factories and, and uh, office locations where they were trying to establish themselves as the leading end-to-end um, -end, uh, implementer. Here you can see a little bit about how they were thinking about their different um, uh, investments in technological and design innovation. So you can see some of the areas that they were trying to work on from structural systems to assemblies to the building platforms, software. Um, this was just some of the things that they were attempting to do. I think I'm pulling these from either their website or their presentation. Um, and they put a lot of investment in this Tracy factory, which I visited. Um, back in 2000, early 2020, where they were putting in, yeah, there was a lot of robots. There was about, about 40 or 50 robots. Um, you saw some of the videos I think I shared last week, uh, really going for next generation manufacturing. Um, so every kind of really awesome tech you could think of, they were trying to put in. Um, and they were trying to go very fast. This was an example of how they were thinking about their product platform. With, with different approaches. We've talked a lot about this, but then how they thought about rethinking the subcomponents and the, the prefabrication system. So really rethinking the overall modularity and architecture of the building. It's just a couple examples. I don't remember if I showed this in the class or not, but this was their idea for a bath kit. So the idea that you would have like a bath kit, that your bathroom would come in a small pod and then would be assembled with a screwdriver. Um, instead of usually you would have uh, five to 20 trades coming through to do a, a bathroom. They would each have a small piece, like one trade would do the tile, one trade would do the, the plumbing, et cetera. But they try to put it all in one kit so it could be easily assembled. And then they try to ship that kit in a small box, kind of like an Ikea flat pack, right? So this was an example, another example, I thought of a good example of product design, um, of new product design and thinking about logistics and manufacturing throughout the entire process. Um, and they also were working on the software side of things. So they introduced something called Katera Apollo, which was supposed to be this platform for, um, for industrialized construction that would connect suppliers and manufacturers with design. Uh, and, and this was kind of their vision was that like, here you have the, the old process in red, here's the green process, which is better, but not all the way perfect in, uh, with BIM. And then of course, there's is the, the best process. Um, and unfortunately, they actually ended up shutting down Apollo recently. And this kind of goes into the positives and negatives of such an approach. The positive is that it's a full stack product integration. So they really control all aspects, um, which allows them to integrate uh, in the market. But, uh, and also gives them a lot of speed. So they can go very fast. They can implement the latest uh, technologies. But the negative is that it's, this is highly capital intensive. They have to spend a lot of money to own all these processes, to set up all these processes. And we know that we exist in a business that has a lot of kind of boom and bust cycles, uh, which means that sometimes the market can be really good and sometimes it's not so good. So there's a lot of risk in putting in so much funds into a capital intensive approach. 
And then finally, the third one is uh, Project Frog, which uh, we've used this example before for Industry 4.0. And this is the idea of the, the, the digital systems integrator or orchestrator um, who does not necessarily um, own any manufacturing equipment, but is creating the design tech to integrate between it. So I think we showed this before, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but they make schools and this was their frog kit. We've shown this before. Um, and this was kind of their automation engine with their configurator. I'm not going to spend too much time on, on it, but you know, the idea is that they work on the systems integration. So they're connecting the back end, the manufacturing and the um, construction through their kit of parts and their automation engine so that they can make sure that it can be built by their fabrication partners. Um, the benefit of this, as we've talked about before, is that it's very capital light. So they're only investing in software and really taking this industry 4.0 approach, right? So it's this kind of smart interconnected uh, network of, of factories and partners. And this enables them to go towards very agile development. Um, the negative side compared to, let's say, Katera, is you have less control over the product and it's going to be a longer co-creation process, right? So if you, if you want to make some changes or something like this, um, you have to negotiate with your partners in the supply chain versus Katera can just say, we want it set up like this. This is the most efficient. Let's just do it. Um, so there are positives and negatives to both different approaches. Yeah, so here's the, the kind of summary here. Um, again, the, the, the factory spinoff uh, was really good for DPR because there was little change in their existing business model, so it allowed them to invest in industrialization without losing their core market, um, and allowed them to also learn by, by partnering with a new sister company. But it was a very slower, much slower implementation, and they have to re-educate the supply chain still about how they, they can work. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, then we have Katera, which was full stack integration with a lot of speed to capture the market, but it's a very capital intensive approach. And then Project Frog, it's this capital light, industry 4.0 and agile approach, but there's less control over the product and a much longer co-creation process. Um, the last thing is this uh, idea that we've, uh, I haven't talked about too much today, but if you start to think about theories of disruption of industries, um, there's one theory called, it comes from, from a book called The Innovator's Dilemma which means that you have kind of sustaining innovations or incremental innovations. And I would put something like BIM as an example of a sustaining innovation that helps uh, improve performance, right? So over time, your performance goes up and your, your most demanding customers are gonna ask for something at this level, right? And so um, there are, can be sustaining innovations like BIM that really kind of help you meet the demands and exceed the demands of your customers. Um, but what happens is that we see in many instances, uh, a good example would be Netflix, right? Versus the traditional, well, in the US we had Blockbuster. I don't know what the video rentals were, were called here before Netflix. Um, we had Blockbuster. Um, at first, Netflix only met a small demand of the market, right? And it, it only got to like very low demanding customers who specifically wanted online content and were willing that the streaming quality was not good, right? Um, but they quickly came along and their technology improved, their processes improved to a point where they met the, also the needs of the more demanding customers. And at that point, then Blockbuster or whatever video rental service could no longer compete with the streaming. Um, and the question that I often wonder about is, is what does that look like for construction? Do we have things like robotics or 3D printing that right now are somewhere along here? they're not quite meeting the needs or maybe they're just starting to meet the, the needs of what we call maybe the least demanding customers or customers that, that aren't doing the most complex or, or risky work underground tunneling with you know, a large and, and expensive infrastructure, but more simple approaches, uh, housing being, being one of them. Um, and then at a certain point, will those technologies improve and somehow be, have the potential for disruption in the construction industry? So maybe that's the question I'll end on is, um, do you think that there is a possibility for disruption? Do you think that uh, we'll just see a kind of slow rollout and the existing players will continue to, um, to maintain control, uh, but just kind of adopt these new technologies? Um, but this is my overview of kind of how the construction industry is changing and how these new business models and industry structure are evolving. Um, over the last uh, decade or so in the industry. So 
with that, thank you very much. And I 